uh, this uh, is a continuation of Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, we're looking at 30, a bill relating to um, prohibiting uh, firearms in certain locations. So <clears throat> we have a number of people who are available to the committee if the committee has questions, but we will not be taking testimony today. This is purely for markup. Um, Eric, you had a um, posted on the website an amendment uh, from Senator Baruth and myself. Did you um, put that up to the committee to, to discuss today? Sure. Yep. Sounds good. We'll do. Right. So this would be a strike all provision. Senator Baruth, do you want to? Eric. Sure. Um, whatever your pleasure. Why don't we use Eric? It, okay. Is this draft 1.1? I can't see that. Yes, it's draft 1.1 of the strike all amendment. So Thank you. you see that on the top there. Yes. So the proposal, you remember the bill has introduced, uh, dealt with uh, location restrictions on firearms in, in three locations. It was hospitals, government buildings, and child care centers. Those were the three places uh, in, the, in the bill as introduced, as I said. So this is a proposed strike all amendment from Senators Baruth and Sears that uh, takes out the prohibition on possession at child care centers and government buildings, and instead uh, has just a prohibition on hospital buildings. And you'll see uh, that's here in the new section 4023 and the couple of things that are that are added in addition to to the general prohibition on firearms and hospitals a couple of clarifications are made that are different in this strike all amendment as opposed to the bill as the language in the bill is introduced the first one you'll notice is uh, it, actually in the title of the bill but i should say the title of the section 4023 and you'll see it carries through the rest of the bill as well. And that clarifies it's possession of firearms in hospital buildings prohibited. Remember that word buildings was not in the draft as introduced. The idea here being, I think the committee I'm sure recalls the discussion of whether or not it would apply to, for example, in the parking lot or on the grounds of a hospital. I, I think the uh, committee's preference was to have the prohibition apply, um, if at all, of course, you're still discussing that. But I mean, if, if you were to have it, to make sure it was narrowly crafted to be the hospital building. So that's clarified. Um, then you move on to line seven, the, the actual uh, prohibition. And you'll see that uh, initially, it had, or I should say as introduced, it was just not knowingly possess, or sorry, not possess a firearm while within a hospital or at a hospital. Now it's the, the two terms that are added are knowingly in line seven. So a person shall not knowingly possess a firearm. Again, that to address the concern that someone doesn't inadvertently or accidentally go into a hospital building, forgetting that they had possession of a firearm on his or her person um, has to be knowingly. So they have to know that they actually have it. I should point out here that this is exactly the same language that's, that's in the, uh, the statute on prohibiting uh, possession of firearms in school buildings that uses the yes, same- Yes, honey. I'm sorry, who, what? Somebody needs to mute. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so, so I'll just read it to you. You can look at it too, but I'm just gonna read you the, the same sentence that's in the prohibition on firearms uh, in school buildings. And it says exactly the same. No person shall unknowingly possess a firearm about, or a dangerous or deadly weapon while within a school building. So you see, I essentially use that same language. Didn't use the dangerous or deadly weapon, but other than that, it's exactly the same. Knowingly possess a firearm while within, is the other key point, within a hospital building. So it has to be possession, knowing possession inside the building, which is the same phrase, phraseology, the same language that's used in uh, 4004, 13 BSA 4004, the pro prohibition on possession of firearms in a school building. Um, so that's where that, language was, was uh, uh, where that's genesis was. Uh, it's still the same penalty as the bill has introduced that you see in subsection B, it's a one-year misdemeanor. It still includes the 
the uh, exception in subsection C for um, firearms possessed by federal or state law enforcement officers um, for legitimate law enforcement purposes. So uh, those are still exempted. Um, so Eric, can I ask a question about that? Please. It, I th thought in the bill, it did say for uh, whether they're on or off duty. Yes, and the bill was introduced. Yes, that was a good point. And so I went back to the the uh, the legitimate law enforcement purposes it is the more typical uh, language used to exempt law enforcement officers in these firearm statutes. So uh, the on or off duty was within one statute only, uh, but the more common approach is to say for legitimate law enforcement purposes. Okay, thanks. So I, I'm looking at the uh, 4004, the possession and school buildings uh, or on school property in that case. <clears throat> and they, they use knowingly and the court uses knowingly as a standard. Um, somebody mentioned the issue of intent. Is that, uh, that's not covered in either the courts or the schools, right? Correct. You have to, but you have to knowingly possess it. You can't just, somebody sent me it. So they're in a, um, accident, they're unconscious, they're taken by ambulance, and um, they have a firearm. Well, then uh, then they wouldn't knowingly because they're unconscious. They wouldn't knowingly possess it. That, that This was a scenario that they had dreamed up that would get them charged with the crime. Yeah, I don't think the knowingly standard would be met if, if, in the, under those facts. And if I walked in with a firearm, forgot I had it because I'm bringing my wife in and she's, you know, um, had a heart attack or something, and that would not knowingly, right? Right. I agree. What about intent? That's not available in either one of those scenarios. Either one of the, either schools or courts. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, the, the intent question, you'd really sort of, uh, if, if the idea is to make it a possession crime, which which it is in both, as you say, the school and court situation, as well as in this proposal, uh, the intent becomes uh, really not relevant unless you're going to make it, because it begs the question, intent to do what? If you yeah. know you have it, then intent in that sense is synonymous. If all you're looking to get at is the knowledge that you possess it, then intent doesn't add anything. Typically, like for example, in, in uh, uh, I'm looking at 4003 now, 13 BSA 4003, if you add intent, the question is, well, intent to do what? In that statute, for example, you say it already criminalizes a person who carries a dangerous or deadly weapon with the <coughs> intent to injure another. That's a two year misdemeanor. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's what the, you know, usually with intent, you'll say something intent to what? Intent to cause serious bodily injury intent to cause harm, intent to uh, um, whatever you specify. Um, if it's just a purely possession thing, then it, it doesn't add anything uh, to say intent. And I'm sure that's why it's not in the, the uh, school or court statutes either. So in a sense, this is just adding. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Eric? You can take this down now. Eric. Yeah, just to quickly add, though, you know, there is a second section. Uh, oh, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. This is the uh, member the bill has introduced also had a prohibition on possession in government buildings. So that, <clears throat> excuse me, that concept is the proposal here is to replace that with a study from the Capitol Complex Security Advisory Committee. Uh, a, a report and on weapons in the state house that would have to be made to justice oversight uh, by December of this year. And the idea is the report would would look at uh, subdivision one there, um, you know, how the possession of weapons at the state house is currently regulated, including rule 26 of the joint rules, which this committee has already looked at, which prohibits uh, um, firearms in the state house. Uh, subdivision two also has to talk about, you know, some information of previous situations in which persons have possessed weapons and how those situations are typically uh, dealt with. 
and finally recommend whether whether there should be a statute, whether there should be legislation uh, addressing the issue of weapons. Again, that sort of um, comes at the issue that the committee discussed, which is, is the rule sufficient or is legislation needed? And this proposes that the, that the Capital Complex Security Committee look at that question and report back to ju Justice Oversight. The only thing I would add is that uh, the, this Security Advisory Committee, the Capital Complex Committee, is actually scheduled to sunset on July 1st of this year. But I spoke with um, Becky Wasserman, who staffs the Capitol Bill, and I guess the plan is in the House version of the Capitol Bill to extend that sunset. So we just have to, if, if this were to pass, we have to make sure that uh, that sunset does get extended. Otherwise, the committee that you're tasking with the force here wouldn't exist. <laughs> so, but we'll do that on our end. All right. Um. I have a Anybody question. else that with the language? Should I pull yeah. the bill down for now? I, I, yeah, I couldn't see who had the question, so please. Question. Oh, sorry. Senator Nick, I recognize the voice. So with regard to this, the, the study, um, yeah. why have this- Can as, you take this down, Eric? Sure. Why have this as weapons and not firearms? I'm thinking of, um, you know, someone brings a cake in, as regularly happens, someone brings a cake in and a big knife to cut it. Seems to me that comes under weapon. So why isn't this just firearms, which is what what this bill is about, and not weapons? It certainly well, could be either. That's the way we did it. Okay, so but it I, could be. It could be. Like, um, I don't. I mean, weapons. In terms of if it includes a knife, how about the cafeteria? We've got all kinds of knives. So it seems like it would be better to study firearm than a well you could you could go to the weapon in the court and use the term on both of these dangerous or deadly weapon and dangerous or deadly weapon means any firearm or other weapon device instrument material or substance whether animate or inanimate that in the manner in the manner it is used or intended to be used is known to be capable of producing death or serious bodily injury Mr. Chair, I don't think your cake knife. Could somebody, whoever's making that, I think that it's me? Devin Green. No, and maybe not Devin Green. Somebody has a train going on behind him. Oh, shoot. I think it's Peggy. <laughs> oh, thanks, Peggy. <laughs> so, could I ask a question about that same section? Uh, first, uh, Senator Baruth, and oh. then you. Um, to uh, Senator Nitka, I, I see the point, um, and it's, it would be um, fine with me to change it to firearms um, if that was more in keeping with what the committee wanted. Would I then be allowed to bring a grenade in? Yep. Yes. Well, so that's, this is a study, so um, one way to look at it is that you could give them a slightly broader charge. You're not writing law. So having them look at a, at a range of weapons might not be a bad idea prior to narrowing it down for legislation. So my, my co question comment on this section is, I, I think that um, I would not like to see a study that just focuses on this. If we're going to do a study, let's do a study on on state house security. Let's not um, just limit it to this. And the other point with this is that we've only limited it to the state house. We have state employees out there who are crying because they don't have um, proper security in their minds for the places where they work. And here we're looking at a study to protect ourselves, but not to address their needs at all. So I would just eliminate this study completely and um ha and and i think that um the cap the um that committee continues to look at security of the state house in general and just have them continue their work i'm 99 percent sure that i'm actually the chair of said committee 
And uh, I would be in favor of removing this section altogether as well. Senator Maruth. So um, I, I'll just say generally, this draft was an attempt to try to um, take into consideration testimony we'd had and opinions that seemed to be expressed in the committee as a whole. So um, the section on government buildings, although we had League of Cities and Towns, for instance, where their board voted unanimously in favor of, of the proposal, I agree with what Senator White said. There, there are um, calls from people outside the state house about their security. So I wasn't comfortable just eliminating the issue of government building uh, security around firearms altogether. Um, it seemed like a reasonable middle ground to task somebody with looking at it and come back to us. Um, so I, I guess we're, we're at a place where we're off and at, which is um, if, if it will move senators toward passage of the bill, that's something I might consider. But if we strike this section, people vote against the bill anyway. Um, I don't think that advances anyone's feelings of security. So, um, so that's, that's my thought about it. I'm happy to try to accommodate, but if there's no, if there's no way people are gonna vote for the bill in any event, then cutting it to pieces to please people who aren't gonna vote for it is kind of a self-defeating strategy. Well, let me just suggest that um, if we do any study, it should be how to deal with government buildings. So the, the way the bill was introduced left a lot of questions about what is a government building, what is essential, and so forth. So I do think um, the League of Cities and Towns, we don't need to put it in legislation. I do think that the Capitol Complex, the League of Cities and Towns, and others need to make some um, to look at this issue. And whether they do it through a study that we require or not is, is up to them. I, you know, I have a real concern, as I expressed, um, about keeping, the reason I did this or went along with Senator Baruth on this is I had real concerns about government buildings. And when you, when I think of the town of Reedsboro, where it takes 45 minutes to get somebody there, um, and one of my first experiences in campaigning in Reedsboro was talking to a guy who was openly carrying a pistol, you know, right on his uh, hip. So, you know, that that's a fairly common occurrence there. I'm sure that they, some of them, whether rightly or wrongly, or whatever, feel comfortable in open carrying or even concealed carrying in there because they do not have um, any kind of security um, available to them immediately. Uh, then I, I also, I thought, you know, that some of the testimony from Commissioner Brown um, from DCF indicated that they were less than enthusiastic about with the um, child care centers. You know, and, and I realized that for most people, that was one of the keys they, you know, that Senator Baruch made some really good points about um, if most people thought it covered schools and would cover um, child care centers. But I do think there's some confusion about family-centered child care centers and that sort of thing. So anyway, um, that's why I went along with this because I, um, but I, as I expressed to you uh, last week, um, you know, for, a long time I've wondered why, and I think we should probably use the same term of deadly weapon uh, that's in the other statutes rather than just firearms in, in hospitals. I, I worry um, about our community hospitals, um, particularly the, the testimony from the doctors about uh, the issues that they're being confronted with on a daily basis in their emergency rooms and the danger there. And uh, so that's why I'm supporting this. I don't, I don't care whether um, we do a study or not do a study. It doesn't matter to me. I, 
I would vote for this as it is, or without, with or without the study. Um, I, uh, if that helps, I don't know. I'm willing to take the hit, but I mean, we're going to get hit from both sides. Number one, we took out the government buildings, took out the child care centers. So that's going to upset some of the proponents of the bill. And uh, obviously those that oppose the bill are going to continue to not support it. And I don't know why my, huh. my battery's running low because I didn't plug it in, I guess. Should be now. So I just want to Yeah, go ahead. I, I just fix my battery. Uh, with regard to the government buildings, we did hear from BGS with regard to their opinion on this, and that they already have they're already covered mm -hmm. with regard to this, so that they didn't feel it was needed. We did hear that testimony as well. And my other thought on this is, um, well, never mind. I, I just no, go ahead. I just don't take out section two. Can uh, if I might ask of people, um, I agree with Senator Sears. At this point, the hospitals are my main concern. If if the, if there is support for the hospital piece of it, um, I'm less concerned about Section Two. Um, okay. So that's that's kind of where I am at this point. I obviously I supported the whole bill originally. I still do, but given our testimony and given where people seem to have landed, um, the hospital piece strikes me as the place where we had the most compelling testimony. And at that point, we would be adding to schools and courthouses one location in the middle of a pandemic where we've seen violence around healthcare and public safety issues. Uh, we would be adding hospitals to that list. Um, I'd kind of like to, Senator, what, uh, before we go any further, maybe it's uh, an opportunity to let some of the folks in who would like to comment on this uh, question. I, I, I wouldn't mind like hearing from Jeanette first, if we could. Oh, please. okay. Go ahead, Senator. Well, I, I don't know what we're going to hear from um, people. It, we're going to hear that they agree or disagree. I mean, I, I can look at the uh, people who are on the list here, and I can tell you they're going to say they agree or disagree. But I think that there are, um, I, I need to have some understanding of what, what this means. So right now, mm -hmm. if a hospital has, a, has it posted, as I believe our hospital does, and many hospitals do, that says no firearms or no weapons or whatever they say, and somebody walks in, they know they have their, their gun with them. They walk in and the um, person at the desk at the emergency room or the, they oftentimes hospitals have security, not off, always law enforcement, but some, secure, some level of security. Our hospital um, contracts with Hunter North, I think they're called. And, um, somebody walks in, they have their gun on. Right now, what would happen is the person would go to that person and say, I'm sorry, but you can't have your gun in this building. It's posted. And the person would either say, okay, I'll take it out and put it in my car. Or they would say, um, no, I'm going to have, I have a right to have my gun in here. At that point, um, law enforcement could be called and they would arrest the person, charge the person with no, tra with trespass. And that, and as Evan said, they would give, be given the choice to go either willingly or go with them in their car. That's the way it would happen now, as I understand it. So there's a two-step process. They're confronted and they're asked to leave or take their gun away and they either do it or they don't. So it's a two-step process. The proposed change would, somebody walks into the hospital and has their gun on them, knowingly has their gun on them. And the 
person, whether it's a security person or the person at the front desk says, you know, there's a law that says you can't have a gun in here. And that person can't charge them right now. So they call law enforcement and law enforcement comes and charges them right then. They don't ask them to leave. They, they charge them. Is that the way this would work? So in both cases, it's a two-step process. But in the first case, they are given the opportunity to leave and then they're charged if they don't. In this case, if they knowingly have their gun on and they don't leave, it is a charge. So is, it is a crim criminal offense. Is that the way this works, that there is a two-step process, whether this um, is passed or not? If somebody can just help me understand this, because I'm trying to figure out what this really means. And, um, and then that person goes away and has a charge of a criminal offense. Could we have Eric answer that? Who would like to? Somebody. You know, we can try. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. I think Senator White, the difference is that in the proposed legislation, it does not require a two-step process. That's the, I agree with your, your description of what, how it works under the trespass statute. It requires that first level of communication of notice. There has to be a communication of notice of trespass by somebody, whether it's the law enforcement officer or, or the okay. person at the hospital, whoever it is. The way this statute is proposed, there's no, there's not any notice that's required. The, the person at the hospital can see the person with the firearm come in the door. They can pick up the phone, call the police and say, this is assuming the law is in existence, by the way. Right. I don't mean now. If, if the law is in existence, they can say, uh, there's a person here with a firearm. It's against the law. Uh, uh, please come uh, either arrest them or ask them to remove it because you can arrest. It's a, it's a misdemeanor, but you can arrest for a misdemeanor that's in the presence of the officer. So assuming the person is still right. there. Uh, the person could be arrested or, uh, or I mean, it's always, uh, up, there's some discretion as to how a situation is handled, but the point I guess is that there isn't, and this is a policy decision for you. I'm not yeah. saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying that's the distinction I see. That, that but, interim step isn't required under, under this legislation. Well, there is a two-step process in practicality because most hospitals probably don't have a certified law enforcement officer at the door so they would have to still call to get one there. So it really is a two-step right. process. I guess I meant by that, not, not that, that the call isn't required, that a communication isn't required. There isn't, there isn't any communication right, right. Required, it isn't required between required the to... hospital and the, and the person with the firearm before, asking, before having them arrested. Or... Right, but I can't imagine that somebody walks into a hospital with a gun and the person that's there doesn't say, would you please take that away? And instead just calls. So in practicality, it seems to me there is a two-step process, but, but, that, but so that is the difference. Right now it would take somebody to ask them to leave and then they could be arrested. If this is passed, they can be immediately charged and arrested. Correct. Okay. Let me just put something in history here. A little historical context, I think. I was here when the law regarding weapons in the courthouse. I was here when we passed a law regarding weapons in schools. Each time was a lot of testimony, a lot of hand wringing, a lot of consternation. But are these facilities where we feel it's important to not have weapons. And that's how I've been down on the hospitals. I think um, it is at such a point where our doctors, our nurses, particularly emergency room personnel have been asking for this. I believe that at some point you'll be looking at other government buildings in this state. Other states have already gone that route. But at this point, um, I don't see this, if one wants to say it's a nose under the camel's tent, that nose under the camel's tent came when we banned weapons in courthouses. And then it was schools and now it's this. And I, I can understand why folks are gonna say, wow, you know, just a matter of time if people keep, you know, violating my constitutional right. But um, I think we have enough 
I've, I've looked at all of these issues. And you'd rather not study? I don't care. I don't really care about the study on the building. I think you're going to get called on by towns oh, yeah. um, at, in the near future. Um, so, so may Anyhow. I just add one more thing? No. Mine, mine ha I am not uh, concerned about creeping um, gun laws. I'm not concerned. I not concerned here about constitutional rights. None of that. What I'm thinking is that um, we heard that there are other ways of dealing with this. And when Matt Valerio testified to us, he had four things that he looks at when we pass a new law. Does it do constitutional rights? In this case, I'm not concerned about that. Is there a current law that covers this that can be used? And will it achieve its purpose? And I'm not so sure that that we don't have other ways of dealing with this. And I'm not sure that it'll achieve the purpose. If somebody has malintent in mind, they're going to, they're going to find a way in. I'm not so sure that this, um, anyway, that's, that's where I, think I am. He, Matt also said, will the bill make anything worse inadvertently right. for those intended to be protected? Right. Mine. That was the... So, Senator Baruth. Um, I, I, similar to what Jeanette just said, I, I think there's a swirl of arguments that get made. It boils down very simply for me. And that is right, right now, this is exactly what we have in schools. And that was a decision we made as a society that we wanted to protect the vulnerable in those buildings. And this was the method that was adopted. And we said the same thing about courthouses. So that, those are in law, they're constitutional, they're everyday life. If you go to a school building, you know you can't bring a gun. This says, let's add hospitals to that. That's, that's all it does, right. especially if we get rid of the study. So I, I think it comes down to something very simple, which is, do people wanna add a third location to those two? And you know, there's no difference. Um, and then if, if, you, if you don't, you don't. And if you do, you do. For me, it's necessitated by the fact that we've had a broken mental health system, which has put people with mental health issues in hospitals in kind of unprecedented ways. And then on top of that, we have an opiate epidemic and a pandemic. And what we have heard unanimously from hospitals and medical people who have testified for us, including the doctors, is that they want this protection in the same way that schools and courthouses have it. So, you know, I, I, I think we're kind of at a point where nobody's gonna change anybody's mind. Um, it it's, comes down to that simple question for me. If people don't feel the necessity to add a third location where you can't bring a firearm, then, then that's how you would vote. Uh, I'd like to give an opportunity for some of the folks that are here. Oh, yeah, sure. To, to speak, if you don't mind. So I'm just going to, I'm going by my, I'm sorry, Senator Benning, you wanted to comment? Well, well of course I want to comment. And I, I thought the rule was we weren't going to take in uh, witnesses at this point in time. And I'm getting no. um, mixed signals, but let me just respond quickly to Philip. You are creating a brand new crime here. And there isn't any difference in my mind between the shooting that took place at the Burlington Mall, because people should feel safe in a mall, uh, or a hospital. Now, we've got this down to hospitals as a third entity. But the only evidence that we have heard thus far, um, I think the most pertinent was from the doctor at my local hospital who was pondering what if somebody in the group that was arguing with each other, somebody had a firearm on them. I don't know how he would have known nobody did if they were carrying concealed, but we don't have any evidence that a gun has actually been used there. Philip, you provided uh, some statements. We never heard any testimony on it, but you provided some statements about the, uh, the Bundy folks out in Washington showing up at a hospital, and some of them were armed. 
there isn't any evidence in that case I'm aware of that somebody pulled one of those weapons and pointed it at somebody. The only concrete evidence we've heard is a guy in Dartmouth shot his mother. And the evidence, as I understand it, is his mother was diagnosed with a brain injury. And I'm willing to bet my dollars in my pocket right now that the defense attorney in that case is going to raise the issue of somebody who was trying to uh, put his mother out of his misery. And other than that, we haven't had any evidence. And at this stage, you're not just adding another crime. I, I spoke about this when Jeanette made the question initially, why do you need to have a gun at, I think she used hospitals at the time. And I don't look at the constitution in that light. I think that turns the constitution on its head because the constitution enables all of us to carry a weapon for self-protection. The question for me is, why should someone be denied the constitutional right for self-protection in a given location? And to me, to overcome my concern about that issue, I've got to have clear evidence that there is a problem that can't be handled in some other fashion. And for me, that's where this bill, whether you have one or three entities attached to it, fails completely. And I'm very much concerned that if we pass this with a new criminal offense attached to it, uh, that you are causing more problems. Because in my neck of the woods, it's not an unusual thing for somebody to be coming off the road from hunting or whatever. I was thinking to myself, I went through 12 weeks of cardiac rehab and I'm in the middle of hunting season. And there's guys around me that have weapons in their rigs who are coming and going from hunting. And I did have a legal question for Eric. Eric, the definition of a hospital as it's listed here has a statutory citation attached to it. Are you able to pull that up on the screen so we at least know what this is actually covering? You're muted, Eric. Thank you. Uh, did you mean to pull it up on the share screen so everyone could see it? Or you can read it to me if it's a short definition. I just want to be clear about what what physical entities we're actually applying this to. Yeah, it's a little lengthy. It might be better to take a quick look at it if that's okay. Could we do that, Senator Sears? Absolutely. All right. Let me try that. Well, this is a lesson on how to get to the, uh, yeah. the law books. <laughs> yeah, so I, should be, under the I should be going slower so I could hear everyone, but I'm trying <laughs> to move a little quickly. So it's in the hospital licensing statute chapters. You see where I've just gone yep. to yep. in Title 18. So you'll see, actually, it's shorter than I thought. You see it's subdivision one there. Um, place devoted primarily to the maintenance and operation of diagnostic and therapeutic facilities for inpatient medical or surgical care of individuals of an illness, disease, injury, or physical dis disability, or for obstetrics. So if my local provider, which is Corner Medical, performs an in-house surgical procedure, for instance, I have some skin lesion on my face uh, taken off, does that mean that falls within the definition of hospital? Uh, I can't uh, proclaim to be an expert on the, the uh, types of facilities that might fall under this definition or not. I can only say that it's the definition that's used currently for licensing. But at least looking at the plain language, I would say arguably yes. Um, it might, might turn on the, on the term primarily place devoted primarily to the maintenance of those things, um, which perhaps, perhaps would be a fact-specific discussion, but uh, 
if the place happened, if the place required a license, I think that the way the definition is applied now is to, you know, is determinative as to whether a place needs to be licensed as a hospital. So any place that had to be licensed at least uh, would come under the definition. So we're creating a new crime without real clear direction on what uh, there could be a legal battle over whether or not a given facility falls within this definition. I guess that's my, my concern. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, Eric. Um, sure. To the rest of the committee, I, I want to say that I, I came to the legislature anxious to try to prevent crimes being created that were not necessary and I really feel that we have not had evidence that tells me this is a necessary step to deprive someone of what is normally their right for self-defense. You know, I, I heard a lot of emotion. In fact, that's the bulk of what we have heard is emotion of people who say, I'm afraid. I don't want to be afraid. I can appreciate that concern but that's not what America is supposed to be about. Unless I'm interfering with your right to be free and practice your own constitutional rights, I don't believe we should be entering the process of creating new crimes that limit your ability to live under the constitution as has been traditionally done. And I'll, I'll, I'll I guess end by saying We've had this rule about schools for some time. That didn't stop Jack Sawyer from developing the idea that he was gonna use Fairhaven High School as a target zone. And the, it is very true that an individual with nefarious intent, intent is not going to be stopped by this legislation. But what will happen is we will rope in people who had really um, traditionally been doing something that they feel is normal and, and has been considered normal. And all of a sudden they're facing a strict liability crime, which, and I know it's been tailored some with the language, but I still look at it as turning the constitution upside down on its head and having people prove why they should be entitled to self-defense in a given location. Mr. Senator, Chair. Senator Booth and then Senator White. Uh, well, a couple of things about what Joe said. And I, I want to start by saying I, I know he's sincere and I know he cares very deeply about the Vermont constitution and the, and the national constitution. And, you know, I've, I've always respected that about Joe. Um, I, I want to just um, speak to a couple of points. One, the incident at Dartmouth. Um, Joe, I, I think you've, for various purposes, every time we bring that up, you, you seek to put it to one side or exclude it. it. It is a case where someone took a gun into a hospital and killed another human being. That's the main fact about it. And, and yet somehow you try to... Um, you always try to minimize it. That's that's a horrible thing that happened. Uh, Philip, if, I, if, if you on. got the impression that I minimize that, I let apologize. Let, let, that let, was not my intent. Or, I just, hang on. I, I listened to you. Now, please listen to me. Okay. Uh, so um, I, I think if the person had injured someone in the hospital, the testimony might be, well, no one was killed. Or if no one was injured, then you'd say, well, no one was injured. In this case, someone took a gun and killed someone else. That, that is a fact. It's a horrible fact that's in our testimony. So the other thing you said, we hadn't heard any information or evidence. We had unanimous doctors, physicians, hospitals across the state. The chair even asked of the hospital association, is your membership divided on this? And we were told again and again, no, it's unanimous. That's an extremely strong set of testimony. We had testimony from all the state office holders, you know, the attorney general, uh, the, the auditor, the treasurer, et cetera, and the attorney general, the, you know, in some ways the top um, 
law official in the state called S30 sound public policy. So we have had strong testimony in favor of this bill. We've mm -hmm. also had some passionate arguments against it. Um, the other thing I would say is that hospitals um, and the idea of a new crime, we voted out a robocall bill, 5-0, that created a new crime. And nobody batted an eye. Nobody threw up their hands and said, oh, we can't create a new crime because we all thought that that made sense. But when somebody opposes a bill, that becomes something that they would never do. Um, so I'm just saying, I, I don't view this as creating a new crime. We already have criminalized weapons in two places and we are adding another place. So in that sense, it's not like we're creating a new category. We have two location specific prohibitions on firearms and we would be adding a third. So uh, again, I think we could go back and forth on this forever. Um, it's not my intention to do that. I, I think that there was plenty of testimony for the hospital piece of this. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm asking the committee to go along. Phil, but if yeah. I could just quickly respond yep. to very right. short things. Uh, first yeah. off, you have no constitutional right to make robocalls. So for me, that discussion is completely irrelevant to this conversation. We do have a constitutional right to carry a firearm. And I believe I asked one of the witnesses who was in favor of the bill, if this bill were law in New Hampshire, do you really believe it would have prevented that horrible event at Dartmouth? And I can't reach the conclusion that this legislation would have prevented that from happening. I just can't get there. And I understand why you'd wanna use that as part of the discussion to pass it, but I don't see this bill, if it becomes law, changing the nefarious intent of someone who is hell bent on committing murder. So I'm, I walk down the road of saying this is in fact a new crime because you are restricting the area where someone can practice self-defense. And that argument is going right back to what Lily, Sharky. I can't remember her, Sharky. Half, I, I can't remember, Sharky Buren, I think was her last mm -hmm. name. Uh, she was very correct. This was the next step in the process. And you and I had this discussion years oh. ago. If you want to eliminate the Second Amendment and Article 16 to have a place where we have no weapons at all, that's a whole different conversation. But you're heading in the same direction every time you add an additional place. And frankly, I was surprised to hear somebody shooting in a mall in Burlington, and that didn't all of a sudden become part of this bill. Uh, because I think that is the direction that this takes us. And my thought process here is if we pass this out of the Senate, it will go to the House and additional locations will be added to the mix before it comes back to us. That's the way I've experienced the past 10 years. And quite frankly, I don't think I've heard evidence where we should be embarking on that path. Thank you. Senator White, and then I will ask for brief comments from anybody else who wants to make one. So I- and I do I mean do, brief. I do love the constitution. I have it, a copy in my bag. I have a copy at every desk I sit at. But I am not looking at this as a viol necessarily as a violation of our constitution. I'm looking at this as the second question that was raised by Matt Valerio. Are there other ways to doing this? And I think comparing it to the robo crime that we just passed, that was um, whether they, we have a constitutional right to make robo calls or not, there really wasn't any other way, there wasn't any existing law to deal with that. So we created a law to deal with that. In this case, we have existing laws to deal with, with this. And we're not 
we're not adding a place where people are prohibited from having guns. They are already prohibited if the hospital puts up a sign. So there is a prohibition against them having a gun at a hospital if the hospital has a sign. So we're not adding an, another location. What we're doing is applying a crime to that now, it, a new crime to that because it already is a crime to have a gun at a hospital if you refuse to leave. You can be charged with trespass. So there is a crime there. So we're, we're not simply adding another location here. We're applying a new crime to that location. So oh, I appreciate that. Um, starting with Devin Green from the Hospital Association, if he has any comments. And I mean brief from all, all those folks. I, I really- Thank you, Devin Green from the Hospital Association. And I apologize for earlier, it's been a long school vacation week. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did want to say that one of the differences with the hospital, I believe, is that every second counts, especially in the emergency department. And I heard a story this morning from an emergency department director who said that his experience was there was a very agitated father whose child was sick who came in and he had a gun that could be seen and the nurses were nervous about it. And he went and confronted the father and the father started to argue about his constitutional rights. And it was all time that he could not spend caring for the child. And he ended up getting the father to listen to him by saying that, but it took precious minutes during that time. So with the trespass, arguing with the person, showing them the sign, going back and forth with them, these are all things that matter in emergency situation. And so that is the difference here is to be able to say, no, it's a law. If you don't do it now, the police are coming. And so that's Thank why we would ask that hospitals remain uh, in here. Thank you. Will Moore, did you want to comment briefly? Please? Very briefly. So to clarify Jeanette's question further and also somewhat respond to what uh, Ms. Green just said, our concern is for the for the person who enters the emergency room, either in a crisis as a family member or um, visiting someone, which is the main entrance to my hospital, and realizes without being asked, they're carrying a firearm and, and thinks, oh my goodness, that's right, I forgot, we're not allowed to do that, turns around to go out to the car. Under this amended, amended version of the bill, that would still be a crime. Under the current statute, that person has the ability to turn around and discontinue and leave the gun in the car or be notified. Um, and as far as time um, for the concerns of emergency room staff, I've worked in hospitals. Um, the return of the police from that phone call isn't gonna be any faster under this statute than it is under the current, current law. So our concern is unintentional lawful carriers who, who make the right choice when, uh, when they're made aware of it or aware themselves of it. Um, anybody else who'd like to comment? Okay. Matt Valerio, who's been quoted several times this morning. <laughs> and uh, accurately for the most part too, which is good. Um, <laughs> the, there, the two things that I, I wanted to bring up is that uh, in the event that anything is passed here that uh, prohibits firearms or weapons from being brought into a uh, hospital, I would make it a requirement of the law that at, the, at every entrance, it would be posted clearly and conspicuously before entering the building that uh, firearms are prohibited so that you give people the appropriate notice, the, in, the person who inadvertently is carrying um, who, or who is in a, in a rush or not thinking about it is at least confronted with something that is posted clearly and conspicuously prohibiting it. And that be a requirement of the law. Um, I would also um, request that you focus, if your focus is on firearms, to focus on firearms because deadly weapons under Vermont law can be about anything um, and it can be and it can be a, uh, 
you know, anything from a, a knife that you wear on your belt or carry with you, uh, you know, to open letters or the like or, or anything. So de deadly weapons under Vermont law is a very broad category of, uh, of things. So if, okay. if you're on firearms, then I would keep it on firearms. Um, and again, that it be posed a part of the law that it be posted clearly and conspicuously at the entry to any buildings. Thank, Thank you. you. That's a good suggestion. Um, anybody else I'd like to voice an opinion? Sir, Kendall Jack Jacobson. Hi, thank you, Chair Sears, and I'm Kendall Jacobson from Every Town for Gun Safety. Uh, with the interest of you know being brief, um, I'll just say that uh, you've heard testimony that this bill's you know prohibitions wouldn't highlight the Second Amendment, um, and you know we've uh, presented you know research. I think you've heard from other folks that uh, you know to debunk the idea that guns are regularly used in self-defense. Um, and, and I just wanted to speak up on behalf of the public buildings portion of the, the piece in particular, because you know, we've heard about people with malintent, but you know, as we testified before, people are people and, and they get passionate and emotional, especially in highly politicized environments. So the bottom line is that there is research to support that you know, the presence of a gun you know, in a location uh, like that in a sensitive space, uh, it increases the risk of violent conflict. And we've also presented evidence of, about the rise in extremism across the country and, and the fact that these are happening in state capitals across the country. So, um, you know, we, we continue to urge you to, to you know, uh, have this bill cover public buildings and the state house and, and believe that a clear law would provide uniform expectations and standards here. And I know that I've spoken to folks in that have provided testimony from, from Giffords and from Gun Sense Vermont, and we all, you know, continue to urge you to uh, keep this bill's application, you know, uh, to, to, the, to the places that are listed in, currently in the bill, but recognize the debate that's gone on in committee today and, you know, I just wanted to make it clear that that's where we stand on that. Thank you. Chris Bradley, uh, Vermont Federation of Vermont Sports. Thank you, Chair Sears. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Thank you. Um, just a couple of very fast points. I believe uh, Eric Fitzpatrick um, in providing us information on the trespass law gave us a case law of Pixley um, in the Pixley case, the court seemed to rule that the sign itself was adequate notice for trespass. So just getting back to Jeanette White's two-step uh, concern, um, nobody has to confront the person. The police can be immediately called, which I think would be the case if someone was in an emergency room acting up or have just walked into the, to the building. So I, I agree with Joe Benning. Um, when we're creating... Uh, gun-free zones um, where there's no element of protection provided. Um, I, I think you're, you're creating a situation where people can be put at risk. So I, I with that, I, I will defer to uh, keep my comments short. No, we, we would like to see at the very least intent, sir. But other than that, okay. thank you. Main opposed. Eric, did you want to comment on the on that? Yeah, just to clarify that on the notice. I don't read, I, I Pixley does not stand for the idea that that a sign can provide notice of the uh, that carrying a firearm on property constitutes trespass. I agree with Mr. Bradley that it does stand for the proposition that a, that a sign can constitute notice of trespass. So if the sign, remember, we're talking about the distinction between whether you can come on a property and what behavior can, you can engage in while on the property. So yes, if the if hospital said, posted signs that said no trespassing, absolutely. If someone comes on the property, they've already received notice, they've already violated the trespassing sign. But if the sign says you can't possess firearms on the property, Pixie was not saying that, that, that therefore when you, you carry a firearm on the property, you've committed trespass. You still, at that point, have to be provided notice with the fact that you are trespassing on the property by carrying the firearm. So that's the distinction that I would point out. Okay. Chris, did you want to just- that, that, that notice, however, does not have to be done by anybody on site. That notice can be provided by a law enforcement that's been called, correct? Thank you. Eric? That's yes, that's correct. That's correct. Um, well, I'm going to use the example of the state house itself. We have a sign out in front of the state house, no firearms or no weapons. I, I can't remember whether it's been so long since I've been to the state house. I can't remember what the sign says. But weapons. I think it's no weapons. 
Um, so how do we enforce that law? We have a Capitol Police. Matt Romeo, I told us how we enforce it. He tells, he goes and yeah. he tells the person to leave or get, bring their firearm out. And if they don't, then he escorts them out and he can charge them with um, trespass. He can, okay, thank you. Okay, and I'm gonna one, one, I only want to make one more comment myself. Well, I won't, I won't say it's only one more comment. Um, the idea that more, you know, when it comes back from the house, uh, that it might have things on it that would concern us, including malls. Um, I think if we, uh, I just don't, I mean, I, that would, I would worry about every bill we pass. I worry about, I, I worry about every bill we pass, what the house might do to it. Um, and what, whether it's judiciary or any other committee, um, and many of you know my concern about that issue. Um, and that's what conference committees are for. And we can always draw lines in the sand. Um, <laughs> I, I am always concerned about that. I am not sure where we stand as a committee on this bill. And uh, no. Can, can I say one more thing? Sure. I, I just want to make it clear that I do not believe that guns belong in hospitals. I, I don't believe that they, yeah. there should I be guns in no. hospitals, but I think there are other yeah. ways of dealing with it. That's my only point. I appreciate that. I, I understand that distinction. I, you've been, it was clear to me, but I appreciate okay. you clarifying that. Senator Nitka. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we add the language that Matt Valerio has suggested with regard to um, signs at all entrances as he spoke. And, and just a question about that. Would that... I think we I should mean, do that, whether or not there's trust pass or not, whether or not we pass a bill or not. I, would, I think think that yeah. um, the hospitals should consider, let's say we pass no bill. And so there would be, I agree with you, that should be in the bill, Senator Nicka, okay. if we pass a bill, but it, let's say we pass no bill. <clears throat> I think the one thing I've learned here is the notice needs to be much clearer um, to um, everybody and including in front of the state house, by the way. I just don't think it's a very clear sign, whatever it says. Um, so that would just be whether we pass a bill or not. Senator White. I do have a question about the, the um, and this is, I don't know if it's gonna help well, me I thought or not, Senator but... Bruce wanted to comment on the sign. On the sign. Oh, I did. Oh, okay. But go ahead, Jeanette, you had already started. Well, I was just wondering about, I'm thinking of Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. It's a complex, it isn't, a building. There's um, the building that where they house, uh, where the emergency room is, and um, that where the inpatient people are. Then connected to it by a walkway, there's a building where there's outpatient. There's physical therapy and orthopedics and stuff like that. Then across the parking lot, there's another building that has um, offices in it. Would they all be covered under this or just the, the part of the hospital that has the emergency room and inpatients, in residential back, patients? I think that goes back to the definition that Eric um, provided, and I don't know that that's clear. I, I didn't see it. Joe mentioned there, but... that my doctor's office, um, my, they can perform especially in the orthopedic office, which is separate from the hospital, they do perform minor surgery. Um, and these, you know. these, this complex is all owned by the hospital. Right. Devin might know. Devin, do you know? I was just gonna say, I believe the licensing definition is pretty clear. I mean, the uh, surgical center in Burlington is not considered a hospital, even though it does surgery. It's not licensed as yeah, a hospital. In Vermont, that wouldn't be a... to what 
but this 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 bill looks at the hospital definition, not what is considered under the licensing. But, right. but the would definition the is under the licensing statute. And, would the GAN and, building? And you, Sorry, I could. I was saying, if you wanted to make it narrower, potentially you could say, you know, limited to inpatient emergency department units, something to that effect. I just didn't know if, like, the Gannett Building at the BMH would be considered part of the hospital or not, Senator or the um, the Richards Building. Under um, Bruce. Question for Eric: Do we do we have in the school statute or the court statute? Are there notification requirements? No. Okay, I I take uh, Matt Valerio's point, and I'm you know uh, I'm open to what Senator Nitka is saying, but I would suggest that one of the strengths of this is that it mirrors existing law that's been in operation for 20 or 25 years in these two other locations to the extent that we try to make it different in any way, I, I think, yeah, Eric. I'm sorry, I misspoke. I'm sorry, go ahead. The, there is no notice provision in the school section, but in the court prohibition, there is a provision that says, I'll read it to you, it's very brief. No dangerous or deadly weapon shall be allowed in a courthouse that has been certified by the court administrator to be, oh, sorry, I read the wrong subsection. Notice of the provisions of this section shall be posted conspicuously at each public entrance to each courthouse. And the, di the uh, difference there might be that with hospitals, there are many entrances and with courthouses, there's usually one public entrance and schools now you can't even get into them. So there's usually only one public entrance. Okay. So I, I guess I would, I would favor what Senator Nitka said. Um, I would suggest that as closely as possible, we mirror what's in the courthouse statute and not make it that it, you know, has to cover every single door that um, leads in or out, but, but the main public entrances or something like that. Sounds like what Eric said, it would, that would work. Yeah. Never mind, just main entrance, That's it needs fine. to be Do, Is there a third vote for the amendment? You mean to, you're speaking about adding the provision that Matt Valerio no, said? No, I'm talking about, I, I think we've all agreed we should add the, add okay. the amendment. But even, I mean, add the provision, but even if we add the provision, is there a third vote? A third vote for the bill, or or, or is that yeah. what you're speaking? Yeah, about? yeah. If we're going to, I guess vote, I'm being blunt about it. Or do you want to wait another I'd week? Like, and I'd like uh, to make another motion then. If we're going to vote on the bill, I would vote that we strike section two. Mr. Chair, yeah. Um, prior to that motion, I my you want a straw poll? My way of. No, no. Um, my, my way of thinking about this was I agreed um, to have the, um, the Democratic caucus not discuss this because the bill wasn't ready. Um, and I, I would personally think it's something that our caucus should discuss um, before we vote. So with respect, okay. I, would, I would ask that we delay a vote. That's fine, as long as the caucus discussion is a public discussion. Sure, on a on a, on a uh, you know Zoom call Tuesday uh, at yeah. Well, obviously it'd be a Zoom call again. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I don't want it done behind closed doors. No, and and that wasn't my suggestion. We, you know, Tuesday. No, I know it wasn't. Tuesdays at noon, we uh, we have yeah, that, and caucus. I can speak to the. Uh, majority leader about them. How about the Republican caucus? It seems an odd request, but how they, about the other caucus? Well, they, they, they can meet as well. I mean, you were speaking about the Democratic caucus. Well, I, that's because I'm, I'm a member of that caucus, but <laughs> Joe, Joe's free to, you know, try to convene his people to talk about it as well. My, my thinking is this, 
Um, this is coming out of an unprecedented time in at least two or three different ways. So we just saw last month an insurrection at the Capitol after which every state uh, government complex was put into uh, a lockdown because we were worried about violence. And on top of that, we're in the middle of a pandemic where people are every day who confront unmasked people or try to enforce public safety measures are being uh, confronted with violent response from advocates who think it constrains their liberty. So I think these are big weighty issues that this bill is trying to respond to. Um, and I'm, I just wanna say I'm delighted as always with the discussion we've had. I think it's been really good give and take um, I would just like the larger groups in the Senate to um, have a discussion before we take another step forward. And that would include think, the Republican caucus if they want to meet. I, I, I would agree with you, and particularly in light of the fact that 16 members of the Senate, Fifth, well, besides yourself, 15 members of the Senate co-sponsored the bill. So to try to say we're either not doing it or we're drastically reducing it without knocking it over with our colleagues probably is not a greatest idea in the world. Um, so I, I, I think your suggestion is a good one, Senator. So I, I just don't want to leave anybody with the impression that I don't want to wait to vote. I have no problem waiting to vote. I have no problem having a caucus. I just thought the way. I understood. Um, but I, I think um, in the meantime, I think there's general agreement to add a notice of provision that Matt Valerio made. And there's general agreement. I, or is there not? It's just so Eric can prepare a, you know, a, an amendment. Um, is there general agreement to, to have some form of notice required. Yes. Okay, so that, that should read it. Is there general agreement to remove the study? No, I, I wouldn't agree to that at this point. Okay. Um, I think it's three to two on the study. But... So can, well, well, can I ask a question? I'm counting the hands going, oh, okay. Go ahead, Senator. I'm thinking the study being amended to say firearms and not the cake knife. Okay. So uh, that, oh, Jeanette? No, I, I, I don't think we need a study at all. I think that we have a, a committee that actually looks at security yeah. at, um, in government buildings and including the state house and that they should continue to do that. And for us to, and, and they do it all the time. They've been doing it for, years they've been looking at should we have cameras should we not have cameras should we have metal detectors should we not have metal detectors so they've been looking at this all along and i think that they we should let them continue their work i don't think that we and, need and, this at all and i i i okay. hear what you're saying senator white i i'm i'm just suggesting that we well, hold off let's leave this okay yeah. let's leave the study and yeah. so for now eric um, but add the language on the notice. Yeah, Eric, could I just ask Devin a, a quick question um, on, on the language of the notice? And we were talking about this. Would it be, you think, acceptable to say posted conspicuously at the at the primary public entrance of each hospital, or or at each primary public entrance? I would think any any public, public entrance. Yeah, I think public entrance is fine. I think many of our hospitals do this. So I think public entrance okay. works. Perfect. Any, thank is, you. Are you saying, are you saying any? I, I mean, I think any is important. Somebody's, any public I entrance. Mean, main public, do you mean? Any public any entrance. Public entrance, skip the main. Skip the main. But I think right. that's because I, my hospital has a public entrances, but one of them you have to have a code to go through, and only the only way a public can get in is if the hospital employees allow you in. Yeah, that would be a private entrance. I would. Think. That's a, that would be a private entrance. So, 
that would need to be posted, but the public entrance would be um, interesting, though. And they, 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 it's an odd shape because there's a public entrance and then the emergency um, ambulance entrance. Well, Brattleboro, for example, right now there's only one, um, the main public entrance is closed and you go through the emergency room, but there are, in fact, mm -hmm. In the building itself, in the main building itself, there are at least four public entrances. And the other thing I think we should explore before we vote on this is, what is the definition of the hospital? To, to me, that seems covered by what Eric has done because it seems to me the important thing is that it be licensed as a hospital um, and, and that's, what this captures right oh, now. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Thank you. So we um, have to be on the I floor. Don't want... Oh, are we? Is we're we're time? on the floor in seven, yeah, minutes. seven minutes. Can I just ask okay. um, if the caucus is going to be discussing this, what is it that the caucus is going to be discussing? If I want to get Randy to try to join with your caucus in a, a uh, mutual conversation, uh, which version of this bill are we pitching to the caucus? Well, the one that we just amended. Uh, yes, Joe, I don't, I don't know. Usually, we do all Senate caucuses for things that are, um, you know, not specifically policy um, or that are broad policy, like the budget. Um, we usually talk about individual bills as individual caucuses. So. I'm not saying Randy shouldn't speak with Allison, but I, I think it may well being may well wind up being two individual discussions um, in the Republican if you want to have a caucus and then the Democratic caucus. We need to adjourn. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, everybody.